14, 1 to 8. Laws for cleansing lepers. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then, if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off his hair and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. And after that, he may enter into the camp, but live outside his tent for seven days. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, turn them now to Luke's Gospel. Uh, as you know, we, if you can remember, we've been uh, beginning through Luke's Gospel. We're going to cover that little section uh, to chapter 9, which is uh, covering the year of the Lord's favour as we slowly work our way through it. We're up to chapter 5, uh, reading from verse 12 through to 16. Um, this is the Word of God. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded you for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Well, we'll do that. We'll take a moment to pray and God will give us understanding of this word. Let's come together. Father, we, uh, we believe that your word is truth. Uh, like the church at Thessalonica, we want to be commended as those who receive the word as it really is, not the words of men, but the very words of God. Would you speak through your servant and in the power of your spirit this day? Uh, would you build up your people in a knowledge of your will? Will you equip us, each one, for the work of ministry? Uh, would you bring before us the claims of Christ? And would you give us attentive hearts and minds that we might not only read but understand the word of God so that it might truly, indeed, transform us and renew us. For we ask all these things for the glory of Jesus and for the building up of your church. In his name we pray. Amen. So just, just, just imagine. Imagine uh, you're a farmer about the time of Jesus. Let's, let's call this bloke Aaron. Mid-30s. Uh, married, beautiful wife, Sarah, five kids, six is on the way. Marriage has had its ups and downs like most do, but generally it's a, it's a good marriage. Got his own family farm, about 10th generation. Recently just added another room and almost in the process of adding a stable. Well, one day he gets home in the evening and he says to his wife, our hands are a bit sore has a little bit of a look at it, just assume it's uh, overuse of the farming tools. But over the next few days, the sores just keep getting larger and larger, spreading a bit further, until finally his wife Sarah urged him, listen, you, you need to go to public hospital there in Jerusalem. So they fast track him. So he has to wait six days. By the time he finally gets to see the skin specialist, his whole hands are covered in sores, and indeed, the very edges of the sores are now turning white. 
It's not painful, but it is leprosy. And a man is terrified. Because he, or as soon as he hears that word, he knows essentially it's a life sentence that ends in a death sentence. And the worst part of that is the process leading to death. It's the separation. It's the exclusion. And he now knows as soon as that's told and he hears the word leprosy, he will never go back to the farm. He will never hold his beautiful wife and kids. He won't even get to say goodbye. There'll be no last hugs, no last kisses. He will now be a leper outside of the camp, outside of the town. And he will only ever live with other lepers. And it's the isolation. It's the the mental and emotional damage, perhaps even more than the physical. And everywhere he went, where there was people anywhere near him, he had to call out, unclean, unclean. And the best that he could ever hope for is that he might see his wife and kids at a distance, at a distance. Perhaps if they were to bring him food to an agreed area and leave it there. This is like COVID isolation on steroids. You remember when COVID first hit? Remember like you'd be on public transport and you have a tickle in your throat and you're thinking, please don't cough, please don't cough. Because you know the moment you cough, everyone's going to wet themselves with fear. Because there was this idea almost that you, I mean, not as bad, but it was like almost this sense you felt unclean because everyone else was so scared. And for those of you who are single, Maybe, maybe just an insight. Can you remember how it felt in those never-ending lockdowns when you were isolated from everyone? Or perhaps if you, got, you were COVID positive and you had to go into isolation. When, when, being a leper in Jesus' day, it, it meant that you were cut off from every institution, from the church, from your family, from society. And, and, and if that a mental and physical toll didn't do you in, the emotional toll, then it would definitely be the physical. Your, your, your extremities, your hands and your feet would have no sensations, feel no pain. People would look at you and as soon as they would see you, they'd be terrified. Or never come near you. That was something of what this bloke's life was like. He was desperate. So here's that Jesus is touring the cities. And out of nowhere, this bloke suddenly, desperately appears. Now, obviously, as you read from the law, and what we know is that lepers are strictly forbidden from coming anywhere near towns. You're not allowed near a town. You have to live outside the camp, outside the town. This bloke is breaking the law. He's desperate. And he hears about Jesus. Perhaps he goes into hiding and he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting for the right moment. And then he finally claps eyes on Jesus. And the text says, there came a man full of leprosy. In other words, he's in the final stages of leprosy. It's spread everywhere. And you can imagine the fear and the terror of the crowds. Mothers quickly grabbing their children and yanking them to safety. Bystanders literally gasping in shock that, that how is a leper amongst us? He's not just breaking the law, he's breaking every cultural convention that enforced isolation. Remember, there's no cure. Quarantine is the only defense for every town, every family, every woman, every man, every child. According to the ancient historian Josephus, lepers were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men walking. Just as an aside, you might know this from the Old Testament, but the Old Testament prophets pick up 
the idea of leprosy and they use it as a graphic illustration of our spiritual condition. They say leprosy is like our spiritual condition before God. I mean, leprosy is a neurological disease that, that, that results in nerve damage that numbs you to pain and disfigures you, indeed leaving you less than whole. Well, sin is like leprosy because it numbs us to God, it disfigures and disorders our desires, so then in a way it leaves us less than whole. And just as leprosy separated people from others, sin separates us from God and others. As leprosy makes us ugly in the sight of others, sin makes us ugly in the sight of God. Just as leprosy left you a dead man walking, sin leaves you, according to Scripture, dead in your trespasses. Leprosy is like an outward and visible sign of an inner spiritual reality of sin and corruption and death. And that's why the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, so many of them would, would liken leprosy to what's going on within us with sin. Now look at the second half of verse 12. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You know, it's a bit like, um, I remember when you were a kid, and you desperately, well, kids know this, you know kids, when you desperately want something, I mean, desperately want something, you know, a bike, a scooter, an Xbox, even, even a motorbike, and you want it so bad, and you actually know mum and dad couldn't afford it. They, they could afford it. That is, your dad could, he is able to buy you what your heart desires. But we all know the real question is, is not is he able, is he Willing. Is he willing to buy it? So it is with this bloke. As soon as he sees Jesus, and I'm assuming he's, he's been waiting and hiding and anticipating Jesus' presence, just at the right moment, he, he falls on the ground and he begs Jesus. It's just, it's just dripping of desperation. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You can. I know you can make me clean. He knows Jesus can cleanse him. The only question turning in his mind is, will Jesus actually do it? Is, it? is it the divine purpose? Is it God's will to make him clean again? In a sense, that's how, this is how we pray, right? Because we know nothing is impossible with God. Every time you sit down in prayer, you already know your starting point is God is sovereign. God is good. Nothing is impossible with God. And so you know he could heal your cancer, he could restore your health, he could save your kids, your parents, your neighbours, he could soften or harden hearts. Listen, God can do anything. The rise and fall of nations are decreed by him. The question is not, can he do it? The pressing question we all ask, will he do it? Does it further his kingdom purposes in your life? Because you actually have to ask that question. Because sometimes leprosy like cancer can serve a divine purpose. Sometimes grey days, long winters and seasons of hardship are actually God's will for his people. Sometimes you are more useful to God in the kingdom weak than strong. Dependent rather than feeling independent. And so we have to learn how to say when we pray, not my will be done, Lord, but yours. But in our case in the text, it is actually God's will for the man to be healed. Verse 13, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, notice that, touched him, saying, I will be clean. <laughs> Normally, uh, when something clean touches the unclean, the clean becomes contaminated. The clean becomes stained. So you get clean clothes and then you, you, know, you lean over something that's dirty, it's got grease on it. Your clean clothes become unclean. Or you know, you've got a beautiful white tablecloth and your wife is on a third or fourth glass of red and you just know, you just know. And if it's not your wife, it's your kids. Beautiful white tablecloth's not going to last much more than half an hour. 
but not today, not in our text. The text tells us Jesus reached out and touched him. He could have just spoken the word. Could have just said, I will be clean. Could have done that. But he touches him skin to skin. It would have been years since that bloke had felt the touch of human skin upon him. It's, it's a display of compassion, not just healing. And only after he touches him, he then says, I will be clean. And it's assumed in the text. It's not spelled out for you, but I can assure you people would have been shocked, horrified. There would have been a collective gasp as they saw Jesus literally reach out to touch the ceremonially and physically unclean. And then this man who is disfigured and broken, the text says immediately, just like that, the longer as Jesus touched him and said, be clean, and he is immediately restored from head to foot. And again, don't miss the spiritual realities of this. Okay, that is amazing, it's extraordinary, and the crowds are going to think it's extraordinary. The bloke obviously thinks it's extraordinary. But it actually points us to something greater, something more important, something more extraordinary of a healing that happens on a cross, which is of greater significance. Because here on a cross, Jesus, full of compassion for sinners like you and I, that he actually reaches out and saves us completely, astonishingly, transformatively. And he does that in the opposite way in our text. In our text, he, the clean touches the unclean and makes them clean. But, but on the cross, it's the reverse. What he does is you get the one who is without sin and then he takes our sin. Our ugliness, our alienation, our transgressions, and he takes them upon himself. And so the one who is without sin, he actually, text tells us, becomes sin. And, and the loved one, the beloved one of God, his beloved son, the loved one becomes the forsaken one. The one who walked in obedience and love becomes actually an object of divine wrath. And our disobedience and sin, that's God's compassion. That's God's love. That's God's saving. And that's a, that's a far more important eternal truth. And the, the danger is you just become immune to this stuff. You just hear it every Sunday. You read it in your Bible and it's sort of, lol, yeah, okay, great. Jesus died for me. And we have a way of sin hardening us to the fact that God had compassion upon us on the cross. He loved the world so that he gave his only beloved son. And in a sense, we're no longer actually amazed by grace. God's son has healed you. And he did it by taking your sin upon himself, taking your wrath that was due you and your indifference, all of that transgression upon himself, your lies and your pride and your anger and greed, your vanity and your immorality and your selfishness and your indifference. He takes your bad marriage and your dodgy work and every secret sin unknown to men but known to God and he nails it on a cross. And in compassion, he reaches out and he heals and he saves you. Or in the words of Isaiah, he was crushed for your iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brings you peace. So that by his stripes, you may be healed. For Isaiah 53, God says, But I, my servant, the righteous one, shall many be accounted righteous. And so with a word and a touch, he makes the man clean. And the verse ends noting that immediately the leprosy left him. Just as the moment that you put your hope in Jesus Christ, immediately you are saved. 
Immediately, God's wrath has been dealt with. Immediately, you become righteous in Christ. Immediately, you receive an inheritance. Immediately, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have loved you. And the Spirit will dwell in you. And Christ will be your not only your Saviour, but he will be your great high priest who intercedes on your behalf. Immediately. So there will be no condemnation immediately for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then verse 14 says, and he charged him, that is the bloke, to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest, make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. Don't get telling you, you know, I want a circus. Let's do this by the book, by the law. Go show yourself to the priest. The priest is sort of like a public health inspector. And once the priest tells you you are clean, spend the next eight days making sacrifices, and after that he had the green light to return to the covenant community, and once again he'd be welcome into the house of God. And he says you do this as a testimony. Well, the, I think the ESV says to them, the Greek is ambiguous and it could actually mean against them. This is a testimony against the priests who are rejecting me and the scribes who are rejecting me, against those who are slandering me. You go show them how you've been healed and it will be a testimony against those priests who should believe but don't. Now, as most of you know, this story of the leper being healed recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And what you find in all these stories, which is always interesting, each gospel always sort of emphasizes or highlights something that one of the others doesn't. That is, they all share general truths, general truths like a leper earnestly seeking Jesus, Jesus has authority over leprosy, that Jesus is compassionate and he's willing to heal, and in fact does heal, and it elicits some sort of response from the crowd. However, what you find is that each of the authors also include some sort of different information, information that points to specific details that are shaping their message. But let me, let me, let me give you an example of how this might work. So suppose I told you a story um, called Sebi Goes to Church, right? So Sebi gets up at 6 a.m. and he feeds Luca. He then helps bathe and dress Clara gets Bricky for Elijah and Grace and helps them with their hair and clothes. He, he wakes up sleepy old Esther, gives her a breakfast and tells her that he's ironed her clothes and she'll find them at the end of the bed. He's also made sure before he gets everyone ready that he's put the beef in the slow cooker so everything will be ready when he gets home from church to serve lunch. After a quick clean-up of the house, he finally gathers his family and he brings them to church where he worships and serves with most many others. Now, what's the point being emphasised here? All those details, what are they pointing us to? Yes, Sebi goes to church. Of course he goes to church. But what, what, what's, what's been emphasised is Sebi's devotion, his desire to get to church, regardless of all the obstacles of a, a sleepy wife and lots of kids and a messy house. He gets through all that stuff because he wants to get to church. Now, what if I told you the same story this way? Sebi goes to church. He, he gets up in the morning, sorts out his family, gets them all in the car and arrives at church. But once he arrived, he helped in the kitchen, serving coffee. He then stood at the doors and greeted people as they walked in. During the service, he read scripture. After the service, he served a morning tea, then made his round, mingling with the men, encouraging them in the faith. Now, in a sense, it's the same story about Sebi going to church but, but there's different, some different facts there. What's the point of being emphasised here? It's not so much the fact um, of his devotion of overcoming obstacles to get to church. What's been emphasised is his service. How when he gets to church, how he's always looking to serve. Well, that's what it's like with the Gospels. Do you know, Matthew's Gospel doesn't include verses 15 and 16, which we're about to get to. Matthew's sole purpose in the telling of the story of the leper, is to identify who Jesus is by the miracle of the cleansing 
it tells us something about both the power and identity of Jesus. And then when Mark tells the story, he adds a little bit of detail to Matthew's story. Mark adds that the reason for the healing was compassion. It says that Jesus was moved by compassion. Matthew doesn't mention that. Mark also adds that Jesus commanded the man to tell no one. Well, Luke says that too. But, but Mark wants you to know this bloke who gets healed is full of enthusiasm and zeal. And so when he goes off, he can't help but just tell everybody the very thing that Jesus told him not to do. It's just an extent that Mark says that it even hindered Jesus' ministry. And so what Mark focuses on is the response of the leper. That's his focus. But when you get to our man Luke and his version of it, he focuses on the response of the crowd and the response of Jesus. Look at verse 15 and 16, which only Luke has these details. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He wants you to know that. Mark and Matthew didn't want you to know that. It wasn't important to what they wanted you to know. One wanted to work on the identity and power of Jesus. Mark wants you to know about the response of the leper. No, no, no. Here, what Luke wants to do is focus you on the response of the crowd and then Jesus responds to them. So the news is spreading. Stories are circulating. Crowds spoke of the healing, the power, the compassion. Notice again, Luke doesn't tell you it's because the leper went and told everyone. He did, but he's not, he's not focused on that. It, 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 the crowd are now frenzied, and there are great crowds who are now gathering to hear him and no doubt to be healed by him. And so the crowd's response is overwhelmingly positive. But you know, Luke gives you that curious statement that Jesus' response to the great crowds is to withdraw, is to slip away. And you've been invited by Luke to ask, why would he do that? I mean, the arrival of great crowds, it's the epitome of success. And yet as the great crowds arrive, Jesus leaves. And if we're honest, that actually perplexes us. I mean, he is killing it. Church is booming, and then he just walks away. And the reason why, because in our thinking, the crowd is sovereign. We, we set up church to please crowds. We do good music, or we have excellent Sunday schools for the children. We preach practical, but certainly not overly long sermons. We'll even meet in a time and place that suits the crowd, because in our day, the crowds are sovereign. But in Jesus' ministry, the crowd is not sovereign. The Father is. God's will and mission are sovereign. And that's why he has no problems whatsoever of just slipping away, of walking away from huge crowds. In fact, he'd rather pray than be popular. And Luke is reminded us that Jesus is no servant of the crowds. He's a servant of the Father. And that's why he walks away from what looks like success. Indeed, why he actually prioritizes prayer over the crowds. Because as far as he's concerned, it's more important to commune with the Father, to fix his eyes on that coming cross, to prepare his soul for the betrayal and the rejection to find grace and strength and fidelity that he might be able to fulfill the work to which he has been called to offer himself as a ransom for many. And you see, Luke gives us this peculiar insight on the miracle and it's instructive to us. Because ultimately, if we're going to fulfill our mission, if we're going to keep our eyes fixed on Christ and his coming kingdom, then we too will have these pivot points where we'll have to make a choice between Christ and the crowd. And nothing indicates our preferences or our choices more than the priorities when it comes to prayer. Because prayer is where you get your heart recalibrated. Prayer is where you block out all the clamoring voices and the tyranny of the immediate 
and the almost disorientating desires that, that are constantly around us, where God, as we come before him in prayer, reminds us again and afresh of what our actual calling is to follow Jesus, what our mission is to proclaim Jesus. Listen, you are not servants of the crowd. You are servants of Christ. You are servants of the King. And Luke would have you meditate on that today. What would it look like for you this week as he sends you out on mission to be a servant of the King and not the crowd? What would it look like if you went to school this week not to please the crowd, but to please the king. What would it look like in your marriage, in your parenting, in your workplace, in your finances, in your relationships, in your priorities, in your prayer life this week, just this week? If you're a servant of the king and not the crowd, because that's what you are. By God's grace in the gospel, you are all servants of the sovereign king. Amen?